Hello and welcome to Sex Ed, a podcast that carefully explores and shares the history of unorthodox faiths. I'm Michael Albany. And I'm Patrick Reynolds. And in this episode, we'll be picking right back up where we left off last time with the formation of the Sud- uh, with the formation of the Sudanese Mahdist state, or the Mahdia, and the sudden death of Muhammad Ahmad al-Mahdi, its founder and religious leader. If you haven't already, we definitely recommend that you listen to episode 14 before listening to this one because it provides some important background information and the context of what we'll be talking about today. Before we begin, though, we want to take a brief moment to mention something new. We've launched a Patreon campaign. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform that allows people to contribute as little as $1 a month to content creators whose work they enjoy. You can donate as much as you're able each month, and you can terminate your patronage at any time. As a way of thanking all those who decide to financially support our show, we We've set up several rewards, so if you want to help us make more episodes of Sex Ed and Sex to Credit, head on over to patreon.com slash sex ed and check them out. With all that said, let's move right on to today's topic. On June 22, 1885, Muhammad Ahmad al-Mahdi succumbed to an unknown illness, most likely malaria or typhus, and died. As might be expected, the Mahdi's sudden passing was met with widespread mourning from Muslims across the Sudan. Thousands of grieving Ansar gathered in the city of Omdurman, where the Mahdi had settled and wept as they covered his body by ritualistically tossing handfuls of soil into his grave. For members of the Mahdi's inner circle, though, the mourning period was short-lived. They needed to quickly name a new ruler of the Mahdist state. Several senior officials, along with the Ashraf, the Mahdi's kinsmen, convened a council with the three caliphas, the men Muhammad Ahmad had appointed to lead his armies and eventually succeed him. Khalifa Alid Wadhilu commanded the Mahdiya's Green Flag Regiment, which was made up of some of the Mahdi's most pious followers. Khalifa Ali was himself a pietist, someone who sincerely believed that Muhammad Ahmad was a divinely guided one, so he had no strong desire to supplant him. The same cannot be said of Khalifa Muhammad al-Sharif, not to be confused with the Sufi sheikh of the same name who'd mentored Muhammad Ahmad. This Muhammad al-Sharif was an Ashraf, a blood relative of the Mahdi, who claimed to be directly descended from the Prophet Muhammad. With strong support from fellow Ashraf and the Mahdiya's Red Flag Regiment, Muhammad al-Sharif considered a new leadership position all but secure. In the end, though, control of the Mahdi state went to Khalifa Abdullahi, whom the Mahdi had named as his true successor shortly before his death by proclaiming, quote, The Khalifa is of me and I am of him. Follow him in every matter. According to one chronicler, as the Ashraf forcibly lobbied for Muhammad al-Sharif to succeed the Mahdi, quote, The people began to argue, and Khalifa Abdullahi was silent, saying nothing but listening and observing. Then, a representative of the Falada tribe stood up and took Khalifa Abdullahi by the hand and said, We swear allegiance, O Khalifa of the Mahdi. In addition, the patriarch of the Ashraf rose and took the sword and turban of the Mahdi, presented them to Khalifa to Khalifa Abdullahi, and said to him, We hereby give allegiance. After him, Khalifa Ali Wad Hilu came forward and took the oath of allegiance. At the very end, some of the Ashraf came forward and took the oath of allegiance. Finally, Khalifa Muhammad al-Sharif came forward and took the oath. End quote. As repetitive as that account may have sounded, the order of people who pledged their allegiance to Khalifa Abdullahi is important. It was only at the very end, when they had no other allies standing by them, that Muhammad al-Sharif and many of the Ashraf finally submitted, foreshadowing many years of conflict to follow. For the moment, however, Khalifa Abdullahi was the undisputed ruler of the modest state. But who exactly was Khalifa Abdullahi? Khalifa Abdullahi was born Abdullah ibn Muhammad al-Taishi, sometime around 1846, to a family in the Taishi branch of the Bakara or Bagara nomads. In our research, we've seen both pronunciations, Bakara and Bagara. His father, Muhammad Karar, was a revered Sufi sheikh who belonged to the same Samaniya order that Muhammad Ahmad would eventually join. While his position was prominent enough to earn him considerable respect, Muhammad Karar was also famous because he practiced divination and could supposedly see into the future. The Taisha considered him an invaluable asset, and they consulted him before going out on raids, only proceeding if he, for, if he foresaw a favorable future for them. Muhammad Karar had two wives and five children, and he wanted all of his progeny to become well-versed in interpreting the Quran and other Islamic texts. However, 
Abdullahi had little interest in formal education, with some sources suggesting that he could neither read nor write. Rather than be discouraged by this, Muhammad Karar took it as a sign that his son was also meant to be a master of divination. Under his father's tutelage, Abdullahi matured into a sheikh as well, but his future sight proved much less powerful. When another branch of the Bagara called for a clairvoyant to aid them in their war against a ruthless slave trader, Abdullahi failed to lead them to victory. Devastated by this, he decided to accompany his father on a pilgrimage to Mecca, but Muhammad Karar died on the journey. Now deprived of even his father's guidance, Abdullahi resolved to search for someone new to follow, the legendary Mahdi. While traveling through the Nile Valley, Abdullahi heard about Muhammad Ahmad and the pious community that he'd established on Aba Island. Thinking it'd be worth investigating, he made the trek there, and when he laid his eyes on the self-proclaimed Mahdi for the first time, he reportedly fainted and remained unconscious for almost an hour. When he awoke, he looked around and happened to see Muhammad Ahmad again, at which point he passed out for a second time. Finally, Abdullahi managed to wake up and maintain some degree of composure and bowed to Muhammad Ahmad, kissed his hand, and pledged eternal allegiance to him. Now, while Abdullahi may have embellished some elements when he later recalled that encounter, it's, it's undeniable that something about him endeared him to the Mahdi. As we briefly discussed in our previous episode, Abdullahi rose rapidly through the ranks of the Mahdist movement, basically becoming the Mahdi's right-hand man. One explanation for how this could have happened can be found in the African Islamic concept of, of Baraka. Baraka, as one scholar defines it, is a benign force of divine origin which bestows physical superabundance and prosperity and psychological happiness. In other words, it's an innate quality akin to charisma. In the African Islamic tradition, few individuals possess it in great quantities. The Prophet Muhammad could definitely be seen as someone imbued with Baraka, and his charisma is part of what made him such an effective leader. Likewise, the Ansar saw Baraka in the Mahdi. In most cases, Baraka is thought to be transmitted along family lines, which is part of the reason why Muhammad al-Sharif considered himself the Mahdi's natural successor. Surely as a member of the Mahdi's family, he would be just as charismatic and capable of leading the new caliphate. Nevertheless, Abdullahi demonstrated that he could also be quite charismatic, especially since he was able to convince a large group of his Bagara kinsmen to join the Mahdist movement under the banner of the Black Flag Regiment. Abdullahi also shared an incredibly close connection with the Mahdi that he said endured even after death. Shortly after Muhammad Mahd was buried, Abdullahi said, quote, I saw while in a state between sleep and consciousness a hand of brilliant light stretching forth toward me from the heavens. This hand took my hand and I pledge my allegiance to the strengthening of the religion. And you all know that the divine assistance in which God provided his Mahdi continues and did not end with the Mahdi's call to the next world. The sword of victory is in the hand of the servant of God, which was given to me by the Mahdi in accordance with the prophetic presence." End quote. Much like how Muhammad Ahmad claimed to communicate with the prophet Muhammad, Abdullahi alleged that he interacted spiritually with the Mahdi, proving incontrovertibly that he should inherit sovereignty over the Mahdist state. In the days following Muhammad Ahmad's funeral, Abdullahi did everything he could to emphasize his similarity to the departed Mahdi. He even searched for the Mahdi's treasured silver ring, but the Mahdi's wives took both it and his sword and presented them to Muhammad al-Sharif, offering their loyalty to the Ashraf. Nevertheless, Khalifa Abdullahi's charisma, along with Muhammad Ahmad's deathbed endorsement, ultimately put him in position to assume the new title Khalifat al-Mahdi meaning the successor of the Mahdi. As the new ruler of the Mahdiya, Caliph Abdullahi's first order of business was to survey the present state of the nation. He began by ex examining the Bayat al-Mal, the Mahdist state's public treasury that was mostly filled with spoils from the recent war with Egypt, along with tithes, alms, taxes, and fines collected for minor crimes like drinking and smoking. Before he died, the Mahdi appointed Ahmad Suleiman as the first commissioner of the treasury. But when the caliph scrutinized his department's records, he noticed he wasn't keeping precise figures on expenditures. He quickly ordered a search of Ahmad Suleiman's home, where authorities discovered he'd been hoarding gold not stamped by the treasury. Khalifa Abdullahi removed uh, Ahmad Suleiman from office and had him imprisoned, replacing him with Ibrahim Wad Adlan, a merchant who he hoped would be more obedient. Then, he proceeded to appoint judges and other public officials either related to him or associated with the Bagara. He named his half-brother Yaqub to the 
command of the Black Flag Regiment, and gave his eldest son, Uthman, the title Sheikh al-Din, or Elder of the Faith. Growing concerned at their loss of power and influence, the Ashraf contacted Muhammad Khalid, the governor in Darfur, who also happened to be one of the Mahdi's cousins. They wanted his troops to march on Omdurman and depose Khalifa Abdullahi, but the Black Flag Regiment intercepted the invading army in the town of Bara and arrested Muhammad Khalid. In May of 1886, Khalifa Abdullahi confronted Khalifa Ali and Khalifa Sharif, requesting that they surrender control of their regiments to Yaqub. Ali Wad Hilu gladly gave up his command, but Sh uh, Muhammad al-Sharif did so only grudgingly. To further consolidate his power, Khalifa Abdullahi ordered an evacuation of the former Sudanese capital of Khartoum. In September 1886, he declared that all of its inhabitants, including the Ashraf, should immediately move to the Sudan's new capital city. Omdurman. Wanting to fulfill his departed mentor's goal of separating completely from the Turkaya, Khalifa Abdullahi determined that Khartoum was a place of unredeemable infidelity. He planned to transform Omdurman into a city worthy of the title Asimat al-Islam, or the capital of Islam. To do this, he initiated the building of several structures, the most important being the Mahdi's tomb. Construction began on November 7, 1888, with a ceremony in which approximately 30,000 Ansar gathered near the banks of the Nile River. They lifted stones onto their shoulders and carried them into the capital, depositing them where the Mahdi had been laid to rest. Khalifa Abdullahi led the procession, followed by Khalifa Ali, and Khalifa Sharif relegated to third place. When the tomb was complete, a domed building that the Khalifa claimed to have designed himself, it became the Sudan's most prominent pilgrimage site, in part because even after the Mahdi disbanded all of the nation's Sufi brotherhoods, the influence of Sufism still lingered in Sudanese culture. One key tenet of Sufism is that the bodies of sheikhs can confer blessings upon those who visit them. After all was said and done, the Mahdi's followers undoubtedly still considered him a sheikh, and his burial ground was venerated accordingly. Right next door to the Mahdi's tomb, Khalifa Abdullahi ordered a massive mosque erected, with a courtyard that could hold as many as 70,000 worshippers. And to the Ashraf, it was only rivaled in brilliance by mosques in Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Khalifa Abdullahi led prayers there five times a day, standing in the mirab, the niche carved in the mosque wall for the imam. Even when he was sick and his bodyguards had to take over his services, no one else dared stand in that mirab. Behind the Mahdi's tomb and the Khalifa's mosque, the third most important structure in Omdurman was Abdullahi's home. You'll recall from our previous episode that the Mahdi tended to live in humble quarters because as an insurgent leader he was always on the run, and there was never time to set up anything too opulent. Khalifa Abdullahi, however, did not follow his predecessor's example in this case. Now that he had a permanent capital from which to rule, he began surrounding himself with some of the more grandiose trappings common in courts in the Fung Sultanate. He even raised two tame lions as pets. Soon enough, Khalifa Abdullahi succeeded in emptying Khartoum of every major structure except the dockyard, which couldn't be moved for obvious reasons. Omdurman became both the religious and administrative center of the Khalifa's modest state, which means that it was also home to something we haven't highlighted until now but really need to talk about, the slave market. Again, in our previous episode, we discussed how some joined the modest movement simply because they opposed the, Tur the Turkey's attempt to end the Sudanese slave trade. Consequently, when Khalifa Abdullahi came to power, he embraced enslavement as a nationwide necessity. The Mahdi had put enslaved people to work in productive labor and even used them as living currency, but those who were captured in battle were predominantly used as jihadiyya, enslaved soldiers. The slave market was attached to the Bayad al-Mal, and we have some fairly detailed descriptions of it, courtesy of European prisoners of war who wrote about their experience in the Mahdist state. In his captivity narrative, Fire and Sword in the Sudan, Rudolf Slatten describes the slave markets as a house roughly built of mud bricks, round the walls of the house numbers, numbers of women and girls stand or sit. They vary from the decrepit and aged half-clad slaves of the working class to the, to the gaily decked surai, surya? Uh, to the gaily decked surya or concubines. And as the trade is looked upon as perfectly natural and lawful business, those put up for sale are carefully examined from head to foot without the least restrictions, just as if they were animals. Reading Slatton's account that Patrick just quoted from, it's relatively easy to identify parallels between what took place in the Omdurman slave market and slave sales in the antebellum American South. 
However, it's important to keep a few things in mind. First, Slatton didn't describe the modest state slave market as such a reprehensible institution because he genuinely considered the people of Sudan to be his equals. Several years after he escaped from captivity, he said of the Sudanese people, quote, we are in a futile pursuit to lift them to our standard. These godforsaken swine do not deserve treatment as free, independent men, end quote. Slatton was, even by some 19th century standards, a bigot, and he hated the Madia for capturing him. So we have to take his vindictiveness into account when analyzing his work. While Khalifa Abdullahi supported the institution of slavery, he did introduce some reforms that are worth mentioning. He made it illegal to separate enslaved families, especially children from their mothers. He made the testimony of jihadia admissible in courts. Nevertheless, slavery is still slavery, plain and simple, and enslaved people in the Sudan certainly resisted, including the jihadia, who in some places broke out into full-scale revolt. This no doubt filled Khalifa Abdullahi with some degree of paranoia, since the jihadia had quickly become a ubiquitous component of the Madia's military. Even the Mulazmiya, the Khalifa's elite guard, commanded by his son Uthman, were comprised of about 5,000 free Bagara and 4,000 jihadia. Even with some isolated slave uprisings, by 1887, Khalifa Abdullahi felt confident enough to begin realizing Muhammad Ahmad's ultimate ambition, exporting the Mahdist movement to other parts of the world. Early that year, he sent letters to the Khedive of Egypt, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and even Queen Victoria, urging them all to submit to the Mahdiya. In his letter to the British monarch, he said, I am summoning you to Islam, and if you embrace Islam and testify that there is no God save God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God, and if you follow the Mahdi, and obey my commands, I will receive you and announce the glad tidings that you have been saved from eternal punishment and damnation, and your mind will be at rest, end quote. Meanwhile, Caliph Abdullahi planned to invade Ethiopia, Sudan's neighbor to the southeast. For decades, the borders separating Ethiopia and the Sudan had been in question, with tensions compounded by policies of Ethiopia's new emperor, Johannes IV. Johannes IV was a devout Christian, and when he rose to power, he promised to expunge all heretical Christian sects, along with pagans, Jews, and Muslims from his empire. By 1880, he claimed to have successfully converted 20,000 pagans, 50,000 Muslims, and over half a million practitioners of indigenous religions to Christianity. In addition to seeing it as an ideological adversary, the Mahdi also didn't appreciate Ethiopia's stance during the Mahdist Revolution. In 1884, Johannes signed the Huic the Hewitt Treaty with Great Britain, agreeing to aid Egyptian officials fleeing from the Sudan. Thus, the Mahdi state's invasion began in 1888 with raids on several key cities, including the ancient capital of Gondar, which is sometimes called the Camelot of Africa. Still, the conflict reached its climax after only a year. On March 9, 1889, Johannes attacked the Ansar camp, waiting in the border town of Galabat. While it initially looked like the Ethiopians had the upper hand, Johannes was struck down by a bullet, and his army fell into disorder. The modest forces prevailed and captured a small fortune in war spoils, shipping them back to Omdurman along with Johannes' body. For the moment, the Mahdi's southern enemies were subdued, but Khalifa al-Dalahi couldn't claim Ethiopia for himself. After Emperor Johannes died in battle, in battle, one of his rivals took over the throne by allying with Italy. Now you may be wondering how Italy of all countries dropped into our story, but don't worry, that'll become clear soon enough. Besides Ethiopia, Khalifa Abdullahi considered his most pressing target to be Egypt. While the Egyptians and their Ottoman patrons were no longer in control of the Sudan, the Khalifa still believed that they practiced a degenerate form of Islam, and it was up to the Mahdiya to set them back on the correct path. However, just as a successful push into Ethiopia represented the Mahdi state's greatest military victory, the Egyptian campaign became one of its most devastating military defeats, and a number of factors explain why. First, in March 1888, Khalifa Abdullahi ordered all of the Bagara nomads to move from their ancestral homelands in Darfur to the capital city of Omdurman. The Bagara were one of the major sources of the Khalifa's authority, and he wanted them closer to him at all times. Moreover, Darfur had become a hotbed of insurrection in the late 1880s, culminating with the rise of a miracle worker named Abu Jamaiza. 
Abu Jamaiza was actually the second self-proclaimed messianic figure to emerge since the Mahdi's death, the first being a man embedded in the Mahdi's Ethiopian camps who asserted that he was the prophet Jesus, fulfilling the prophecy of the Hadiths by returning after the Mahdi. Understandably, that man was quickly silenced, but Abu Jamaiza endured in Darfur for almost two years until February 1889, when he died of smallpox and his anti-Mahdist movement died with him. Meanwhile, Khalif Abdullahi's decision to migrate the Bagara into Omdurman couldn't have come at a worse time. In 1888, rains failed, creating crop shortages across the Sudan. In Omdurman, Khalif Abdullahi made feeding the Bagara a top priority, and he directed Ibrahim Wadadlan, the commissioner of the treasury, to do so by any means necessary. Despite these orders, what Adlan refused to make other districts bear the burden of satiating the Bagara's hunger, leading to his removal, leading to his removal from office and eventual execution. Along with famine, the along with famine and internal unrest, another factor that hindered the Mahdist state's chances of overtaking Egypt was Great Britain. The death of imperial icon Charles Chinese Gordon at the hands of the Mahdist forces had shocked the nation and toppled the liberal administration of Prime Minister William Gladstone. In Egypt, a new British administrator named Evelyn Baring dismantled the army so that he could rebuild it from the ground up with training from British officers and an ample supply of these state-of-the-art Maxim guns. The farthest that the Mahdist state managed to penetrate into Egypt was the village of Tushki, where on August 3rd, 1889, its armies were utterly crushed. The Battle of Tushki marked the end of what can be considered the Mahdiya's militant phase. After such a decisive defeat, Khalifa Abdullahi decided to dedicate himself primarily to domestic affairs. But first he would have to contend with one more conflict. In November of 1891, practically all of the Khalifa's enemies, Khalifa Sharif, the Ashraf, even the disgraced treasurer Ahmad Suleiman, joined forces and staged a coup. The revolt took the form of a gunfight in the streets of Omdurman between the Mullah Zamaya, based in the Khalifa's home, and the rebels holed up in the Mahdi's tomb. Standing between them was Khalifa Ali, who feared that if the Bagara were somehow provoked, they would end up destroying everything. By the end of the month, he managed to bring Khalifa Abdullahi and Khalifa Khalifa Sharif together to a negotiating a ceasefire. Amazingly, Khalifa Abdullahi agreed to pardon everybody who'd participated in the attempted coup, and even pledged to pay a sizable pension to the Ashraf. After only a few weeks, though, he went back on his word. He had Ahmad Suleiman and several senior Ashraf spirited out of the capital and executed. Then, in March 1892, he had Muhammad al-Sharif arrested, imprisoned, and stripped of his title. It was the last time that the Ashraf would trouble Khalifa Abdullahi for the remainder of his rule, but in subsequent years his paranoia only intensified. He became much more insular, spending less time leading prayers as he locked himself in his resplendent home. He took a hardline stance against non-religious literature, ordering all of the nation's books burned except for copies of the Quran, hadiths, and works approved by Muslim cl clerics. One work that the Khalifa especially wanted incinerated was an embroidered text whose title translates to the, embroidered, the embroidery inscription with the good news of the slaying of Johannes, king of the Ethiopians. Although this work depicted Khalifa Abdullahi as a captivating leader and a valiant defender of the faith, he feared that if Johannes' successors found out about it, it would reignite their border war. Thus, the Khalifa re reasoned that it needed to be erased from history and its author also needed to be executed. Even more controversial than his book burnings, though, was Khalifa Abdullahi's decree that no one be allowed to undertake the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca that's a fundamental pillar of Islam. Instead, the Mahdi's tomb would become the most important pilgrimage site for Sudanese Muslims. While all of this was going on in the Sudan, several European nations were caught up in their own schemes. Remember how we mentioned that Italy secured a foothold in Ethiopia after the death of Johannes IV? Well, they weren't the only one. From the late 19th to the early 20th century, the powers across Europe engaged in what historians call the scramble for Africa. Yes, Europeans had been establishing small settlements in Africa for centuries, but in 1884, representatives from 14 nations met at the Conference of Berlin to formally carve up the entire continent. Great Britain's imperial strategy is perhaps best summarized by the political cartoon The Rhodes Colossus, an image depicting British colonialist and De Beers Company founder Cecil Rhodes straddling Africa with one foot on the Cape of Good Hope 
and the other on Cairo, a telegraph wire connecting the two. In order to make this Cape to Cairo vision a reality, though, the British needed to crush the Mahdiya, and to accomplish this task, they tapped Horatio Herbert Kitchener. Kitchener had been praying for a chance to fight in the Sudan ever since the death of Chinese Gordon, whom he considered a personal hero. Kitchener was actually like Gordon in more ways than we have time to get into, but one key difference was that he was allotted more funding from the British government. Now, Sect said isn't a military history podcast, so we're not going to delve too deeply into this phase of what the British call the Modest War. Suffice it to say, the British succeeded in their reconquest of the Sudan by laying down railroad tracks after every victory, creating a reliable supply line all the way to Omdurman. One of the unintended consequences of the isolationist stance Khalifa Abdullahi had adopted after 1889 was that it put a massive dent in the public treasury. One of the modest state's most lucrative sources of income had been plunder from foreign wars. Without it, the Mahdiya's currency began to lose its value, and the nation couldn't, com- hope, and the nation couldn't hope to compete in the arms race. On September 1st, 1898, Anglo-Egyptian forces under Kitchener arrived at the town of Karari. Ironically, this is the small town where Muhammad Ahmad had spent his childhood, and the modest movement he began came to an end. Khalifa Abdullahi led an army of Ansar, composed of both Bagara and Ashraf, into battle, but Kitchener's troops killed 11,000 of them and wounded thousands more while losing less than 50 of their own. Both Khalifa Abdullahi and Khalifa Ali escaped the bloodbath, but Yaqub, the commander of the Black Flag Regiment, was dead, and for all intents and purposes, so was the modest state. The British soldiers stormed the capital, accompanied by Chinese Gordon's nephew William, who commanded a demolition team that blew up the Mahdi's tomb. Even this, however, wasn't revenge enough, for some returned at night to rummage for the Mahdi's skeleton. They heaved what they could find of the body into the Nile River before delivering the Mahdi's skull to Kitchener, who, unsure of what to do with such a gruesome trophy, stored it in an old kerosene can. News of this stirred public outcry in Great Britain, and even Queen Victoria disapproved of As for Khalifa Abdullahi, both he and Khalifa Ali remained fugitives until November 1899, when they clashed with Anglo-Egyptian troops in a final battle. Acknowledging that they had little chance of victory, Khalifa Abdullahi directed his staff to roll out their farwas, or prayer rugs, and prepare for death by enemy bullets. Remnants of the modest movement survived the Khalifa, but now that they had reestablished their supremacy, the British became much less tolerant of Islamic messianism. For example, when rumors spread that one of Muhammad Ahmad's nephews was launching another revolution on Aba Island, soldiers surrounded his house and shot him. With the Mahdiya no more, Great Britain and Egypt ruled the Sudan jointly as an Anglo-Egyptian condominium. Uh, And if you'd like to learn more about how condominium governments work, you can revisit our episode on John Frum, uh, in which we discussed an Anglo-French condominium on Tana. While the Mahdist War dismantled the Sudan's theocratic Islamic state, it bolstered the careers of many British soldiers. Kitchener weathered the scandal of the Mahdi's skull and eventually became Great Britain's Secretary of War during World War I. Even if you don't recognize his name, you no doubt recognize his face from his Lord Kitchener Wants You recruitment posters that inspired everything from the designs of Uncle Sam to Big Brother. In the end, though, the Mahdi had a fairly large family, so even the British government couldn't silence them all. In the 1960s, Muhammad Ahmad's grandson, Sidak al-Mahdi, entered Sudanese politics and was elected prime minister twice. He's still alive today, and he leads a group that still believes Muhammad Ahmad was a divinely guided one, and they still call themselves Ansar. And with that, we finally reached the end of our story, so are there any loose ends that we want to tie up? I don't know, I just think uh, one thing I noticed is just the role of disease in all of this, how how many huge twists there were. Yeah, Abul Jamaiza got smallpox and he's gone. The Mahdi was, uh, could have gone on for a bit longer as, as head of the state that he created, as, especially as head of this uh, sect, and then he dies from uh, some disease strain through this even though it's not necessarily religious but and it's another way that this kind of parallels the taiping rebellion in a way because in the same way that that rebellion in the post-establishment of the kingdom stage had basically all four horsemen of the apocalypse Mm -hmm. going along famine pestilence death and war um here we kind of have a little of the same thing because there's famine going on there's disease going on 
war, although the actual amount of death, I don't think it rivaled the Taiping uh, Heavenly Kingdom in that regard. I mean, neither neither was very good <laughs> for the people who lived in it. No. Um, yeah, uh, and it's interesting, too, the, the sort of isolation that they go into at the end, both of them, um, Hong Shi Kwan and um, Abdullahi. After they set up their, their opulent capitals and they get their giant palaces, they just kind of retreat <laughs> um, from everything, uh, including their religious duties a lot of the times. Um, Abdullahi was grooming his son to be a successor, but... Um, so was Hong Shi Kwan, but... Yeah. yeah, so they definitely thought this was going to last much longer, that this would be a sort of enduring legacy. Um, one of the difficult things about actually like researching primary source-wise um, this topic is that the people who are writing about it, whose work is in English, so work that I can read, um, it's a lot of Europeans who just straight up hated them and were willing to embellish things a lot of the time. Not saying that there uh, weren't obviously unsavory elements to this, mm -hmm. because this is not only a theocratic government, it is an autocracy. It is uh, one where... And I mean, they were fighting to bring back slavery. So. Yeah. Um, all of those elements combined, but... But yeah, it gets uh, sensationalist, definitely, in just a couple of the ones I looked at, mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of propaganda going around uh, from both sides. That's another compelling point here, is the role of propaganda, because... Uh, in the rise of the Mahdi, you have the British trying to spread propaganda against him. When Khalifa comes into power, he spreads propaganda himself. Um, there's this whole spread of information that uh, I think is one thing that distinguishes this. Uh, the Khalifa had his own printing press in the capital, so that's where they're printing off a lot of things and distributing them widely. Oh, and uh, at the end, wasn't, uh, I guess just as a note, maybe I'll, I'll edit this so it comes in sooner, but um, young Winston Churchill wrote about it, didn't he? Yes, he, he was, was there. He was uh, looking l less like a bulldog than he ever has at the time. Well, um, that's one of the things that uh, I, I didn't add because I'm, I was trying to get as far away from military yeah. history as necessary. There's definitely points where you have to talk about the military element because... The conflict of Sudan and Ethiopia, that's important yep. theocratically, uh, religiously. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, when you have a theocracy, the it's all kind of tied in. <laughs> Churchill, though, but, yeah. uh, Kitchener did not want him there at all. In fact... Um, He's just like a spoiled rich kid. He just wanted glory and well, make himself look cool. Basically, Kitchener, even though uh, Churchill was in the military, he saw through what Churchill was doing, basically. He figured that if Churchill was there, he would not only survive the conflict, but he would then write about it and yep. maybe even write negatively about his superiors, basically to raise his own reputation and parlay that into a political career, which he does That's all That's exactly that. what he does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's quite and, astute of him. To <laughs> and, and in the end, basically, he, like, he, he gets some favors, uh, like, talks to his mom, who gets, like, talks with, like, the queen, and eventually they tell Kitchener, you just have to take this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess there's nothing left to say, but thank you for joining us for this two-parter on the Modest Revolution. If you want to know what sources we consulted in writing it, you can head over to our website, sexed.com, and click on Show Notes. You can also keep up to date with news about our next episode and every episode in the future by following us on Facebook and Twitter, both at SexEd. Funding for SexEd is provided in part by supporters on Patreon and listeners like you. The views and opinions expressed by SexEd do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.